Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. I declared a public health emergency. The governor of Louisiana trying to slow the spread of the deadly coronavirus. This has just really thrown a wrench into the motor works, as you can imagine. An Italian vacation leaves an LPB employee wondering when she'll get to come home. The markets across the world started tumbling. A leading LSU economist on the financial impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Hi, everyone. I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. Everybody's talking about it, the coronavirus, and many of us are concerned. We're seeing major changes in everything we do. Yeah, the Secretary of State, Kyle Ardwan, today announcing the state presidential primary scheduled for April 4th will be postponed at least two months. The first state to do so, this in addition to schools and universities around the state and country closing, teaching students online, state public schools are closed until at least April 13th. Yeah, sporting events and entire seasons canceled. The governor today announcing gatherings of more than 250 people prohibited. During the next half hour, we hope to calm some of the fears that you may have and give you some of the other news that's important around our state. As a precaution to limit crowds because of the coronavirus, New Orleans leaders canceled the city's St. Patrick's Day parade and other related weekend events early in the week, and Baton Rouge followed suit Thursday, canceling all public permitted events this weekend, including its wearing of the green parade. Both St. Patrick's Day events draw hundreds of thousands of people each year. The SEC canceled its basketball tournament, and then the NCAA canceled all winter and spring sports at all universities out of concerns for the spread of the coronavirus. No March Madness, no Final Four. Throughout America, the cancellation or postponement of sporting events at all levels is a stunning realization of the impact. Before LSU's 4-1 victory over South Alabama at Alec Box Stadium, both teams agreed beforehand not to shake hands afterwards as a sign of one way to limit the potential spread of the virus. At the time, no one knew it would be LSU's final baseball game of the season. A Louisiana-based company that provides trucks, talent, and trailers to film companies around the country has bought a New Orleans movie truck rental company. Basecraft is acquiring Hollywood trucks. The expansion will bring its fleet to more than 450 production trucks. Basecraft was founded in Los Angeles in 2001 and moved its headquarters to Metro New Orleans in 2006. The state's top school board this week backed the governor's nearly $4 billion K-12 financing plan that would boost spending next year but steer only a portion of the new dollars to teacher pay raises. Bessie's financial committee approved the proposal without objection. The state is restarting its stalled effort to replace its voting machines. Secretary of State Kyle Ardoin says the solicitation for bidders will begin soon. The new machines will not be in place quickly or in time for the presidential election. Louisiana will continue casting ballots with the type of voting system in use for 15 years without a paper backup that is advocated by so many security experts. Complaints about noise and smell prompted the town of Lake Arthur to ban roosters and put restrictions on other animals such as chickens and horses. The Lake Arthur Town Council voted 4-1 to one to ban roosters, pigs, hogs, sheep, goats, and emus within town limits.
Well, as the number of cases of coronavirus in the state continues to grow, Governor John Bell Edwards Wednesday declaring a public health emergency. The state's first positive case for COVID-19 came from New Orleans and was announced Monday afternoon. The governor held news conferences all week. He was joined by U.S. Surgeon General Vice Admiral Dr. Jerome Adams at a major briefing on Thursday. This is a novel virus with many unknowns. It's important for folks to know that. Things are changing each and every day, and uh, we are trying to rapidly evolve our response to what we are learning both abroad and here in the United States. One of the things I've really tried to lean into is what we've learned about this virus is that it actually uh, really has a uh, very unique uh, way that it affects uh, different age groups. We know that people with chronic medical conditions over the age of 60 are most likely to need medical attention. And we know that people with chronic medical conditions over the age of 80 are those who are most likely to die. But interestingly enough, uh, young adults and children, if they get the coronavirus, their mortality rate is lower than if they got the flu. It's why we see such differential play out in South Korea versus in Italy. South Korea, the majority of people who got the coronavirus were younger, and so they had a very low mortality rate. In Italy, the majority of people who got the coronavirus were older, and that's why you're seeing such a high mortality rate there. Well, the epicenter of the coronavirus used to be in China. 98% plus cases uh, used to come from China. Now, Europe is the new China, and very specifically, Italy is the new China. I declared a public health emergency for the state of Louisiana. The declaration that I signed ensures that state resources are made available to our state agencies and local governments. Uh, it also addresses several issues related to price gouging, should that become necessary, as well as prohibiting international travel for state employees to level two and level three countries uh, that are designated as such by the CDC. Uh, these guidelines were developed by the COVID-19 task force that we stood up um, several weeks ago. What we have to do to, to protect public health more than anything else is lower the peak so that we don't have more cases than is necessary uh, and then extend the duration so that we don't put too much demand on our health care providers in certain areas all at one time. Testing has ramped up in Louisiana. Uh, as a result, and no one should uh, think otherwise, we are going to see more positive cases in Louisiana, that, that is going to happen. Uh, LDH began updating presumptive positives and other relevant information twice daily at 9 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. online at ldh.la.gov slash coronavirus. Again, that's ldh.la.gov slash coronavirus. We owe it to our loved ones, to those who are older, to uh, those with these chronic underlying conditions to make sure that we do everything we can not to infect them because we know that they are the most susceptible uh, to having the, the worst outcomes. You can watch that entire news conference at about an hour long at lpb.org slash health. We know travel has been greatly affected. Yeah, it sure has. LPB's director of underwriting, Jean Smith, is on vacation in Italy. We talked with her about her struggles to return. Hi, Andre. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to everybody back home and <laughs> kind of give you my perspective uh, from Italy. I am here in Colle, which is um, just outside of Florence, where we have been visiting for the last almost two weeks now. Um, we had scheduled this trip six months ago. My friend, uh, we're staying with a friend's family and he hadn't seen any of them in a number of years and so we were very anxious to be with them and spend some time and this has just really thrown a wrench into the motor works as you can imagine um everything was going pretty well um everybody seemed pretty relaxed you could tell the number of people in florence was drastically reduced. We weren't having any trouble getting into museums. There were no crowds. We went to a museum um, last Monday or Tuesday and we were in there for about an hour and then they announced that the museum was closing because they just didn't have enough people on site. And um, 
then we really didn't start to worry too awful much until we went to uh, back into Florence on Monday of this week and everything was closed. Um, all the museums, all the gathering places, all the churches were shut down until April 3rd. So that made us really start to question <laughs> if we were going to be able to get back. We pretty much have been either on phone or trying to talk to somebody on the phone or online for the last four days. Um, we were finally able to speak to somebody this morning from Expedia and after an hour of going back and forth with her and being on hold the majority of that time, we were um, disconnected just as we were actually about to make a decision. Um, as a United States citizen and a permanent resident of the U.S., we can come back to the U.S. We just don't have any way of getting there at this time. So that's um, our biggest issue right now. Um, the earliest flights we've been able to find uh, are at the end of the month, but there's uh, our families and our jobs to be concerned about until then. So... Uh, we're just in this awful holding pattern, and um, I wish I could tell you more, but that's really all I have for you at this time. You can hear her frustration there, but we do have some good news. We have just learned from her that she is now booked and expected to return on Sunday. Of course, the process of being screened and self-quarantined for her would then begin. <music> Doctors and healthcare workers can be on the front lines of this crisis. I sat down with an infectious disease specialist at the Baton Rouge Health Clinic, Dr. Tatiana Saavedra. I think what we could do is probably a better job of educating patients. What we do know is that patients who are older than 60 are those who have chronic medical conditions like heart disease, lung disease, diabetes. Those are the patients that are higher risk. So if we know that the disease is in New Orleans, those patients should maybe avoid, you know, large groups. They should try to stay home, you know, if, if they're concerned about the spread. Follow the guidelines of the CDC. I mean, they are the ones that have the knowledge, they have the experience. So if I'm going to trust any major source of how to manage this, you know, this virus and the spread of it, that's who I'm going to look to. Um, because they deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. They dealt with it when it was SARS back in 2003 and when it was MERS back in 2012. And so I think looking at those agencies is probably the correct thing to do. I know the government has, you know, the president has made announcements and things like that. And while I think that's good to be informed of as a physician, I'm gonna really be looking at the guidance of the CDC over anything else. Hand washing, I cannot stress it enough. Um, hand washing, every chance that you, you go to the restroom, you need to wash your hands. You're about to eat, you need to wash your hands. You touch your face, you need to wash your hands. We are all guilty of it. I touch my eyes, my nose, my mouth frequently. Avoid and, that if you can, right? right? Avoid that. Um, and if you do, wash your hands. Sure. If you don't have access to soap and water, then you know having a hand sanitizer nearby is helpful. And then reinforcing also good hand washing techniques because I think some people just kind of run their hands underwater and that's it. You need to have soap. You need to really kind of scrub it down in between your fingers. 20 seconds at least is what's recommended. And this is a new virus. It's brand new. We've never seen it before. And so we're still learning things about it. And as more studies are done on the actual virus itself, and then also on patients who've become infected with it, we're gonna learn more. But the suspicion is that this will be here for a while. We thank Dr. Saavedra very much for talking to us there. We've seen the financial blows of the coronavirus everywhere we turn. So we turn to LSU economics expert, Dr. Jim Richardson. He spent 30 years on the state revenue estimating conference. Can we fathom the economic impact from the coronavirus? We've never had something like this before. So it's all we're working to kind of fathom as we go. I think the very first thing that happened when it came around 
from China that, that what was going on, the virus, the markets across the world started tumbling, the stock markets. And the stock markets are a predictor. That is, that's what they're doing. We're putting our money into a stock, thinking it's gonna grow into the future. Now we're thinking it's not. It's gonna go down, so we're getting out of that marketplace. So in that sense, the stock market being as predicted, there will be a recession worldwide, and it will be fairly substantial. Now the question is, how is that gonna happen? People are gonna stop buying things? Well, certainly airlines, I've already <laughs> noted that. Cruise ships are the obvious ones that you see uh, on the, at, the, at the top of the list. But now you see all the major events that are also being canceled, such as uh, basketball tournaments. I think the market has already suggested very clearly there's gonna be a downturn. Now the question is, how deep will that downturn be? How quickly perhaps will we find some way to deal with this particular virus? And can we kind of put it behind us? That's going to take much longer than I think most people think because scientific research, finding a cure, finding a vaccine, it's not a one month deal. <laughs> it's a much longer deal than that. From funding for education to bills that tackle tort reform, there are some big issues being discussed in the state. The legislative session kicked off Monday and is already showing signs that the governor could face some uphill battles with the majority Republican House and Senate as he tries to move his agenda forward. The governor wasted no time after announcing breaking news about Louisiana's first case of the coronavirus, diving straight into his agenda, outlining what he hopes to accomplish this year and throughout his second term. The budget that I have proposed to you makes new strategic investments in education at every level. Edwards speaking to a joint session of the House and Senate on opening day of the 2020 legislative session, calling early childhood education his number one priority. At the governor's mansion, there's an oak tree in the backyard with the plaque presented to Governor Mike Foster by the University of Louisiana system. It says on the plaque that a college education starts in preschool and it ends with the saying, Tall oaks from little acorns grow. In many ways, early childhood education is like the roots of that oak tree. It's the strong foundation for a lifetime of growth and opportunity and prosperity. The governor is proposing an additional $25 million in funding for early childhood education programs, as well as more money for public schools and public colleges and universities. For 10 years, Louisiana disinvested in higher education. In fact, more than anywhere else in the country. And we suffered the consequences. For the next 10 years, let's commit to reinvesting in higher education in order to strengthen our state. He says he knows it will take time to fully recover from years of budget cuts and stagnant funding in education. We need to demonstrate to students, to parents, and to educators that we are serious when we say we aren't going back. But we must do everything possible to make certain our children are ready for school from the very beginning. The governor is also calling for a pay raise for teachers. Additionally, the budget proposal includes $39 million in new funding for K-12 education. And I am recommending that all of that $39 million be committed to an additional teacher pay raise. Let me make this very clear. Before the end of my second term, we will have raised teacher pay to at least the southern regional average. The Deep South's only Democratic governor will have to work with a strong Republican majority in the legislature to grant his budget wishes, but fellow Democrats are optimistic. The budget is a very complex, uh, and any time you talk about cutting uh, one place in the budget, you're talking about cutting, it could be families, it could be health care, it could be education. Those are things that are very difficult to think about. But I think over the next four years, what I think I hope we do is work together uh, more so than we have over the past four years. Republican Representative Jack McFarland is the chairman of the Agriculture and Forestry Committee. He's also on the Appropriations Committee. McFarland has authored a number of bills that deal with lowering auto insurance rates in the Bayou State, rates that are the second highest in the nation. I believe that the public is expecting, not anticipating, but they are expecting uh, a reduction in their auto and premiums. 
and they are expecting us to come together, find real solutions, and compromise. It's an issue getting lots of conversation and support on both sides of the aisle. Democratic Senator Katrina Jackson of Monroe is also presenting bills dealing with ways to lower auto insurance rates. I'm actually um, authoring bills that go directly to the insurance companies and the insurance commission to make sure that we have the Arkansas model. I don't know if you're aware, but in Arkansas, their insurance rate is very much lower than ours. They never did tax re uh, tort reform. Tort reform is a top priority for Republican lawmakers and one that could challenge the governor, an attorney who received significant campaign support from trial lawyers. Let's be clear. Auto insurance costs too much in Louisiana, period. That's why I'm supporting a series of bills, all of which are being carried by Senator Jay Luno, that will actually help to lower auto insurance rates for people in Louisiana and prohibit certain arbitrary penalties. If in addition to real insurance reform you want to pursue other efforts, I am absolutely willing to sit down with you and discuss with a goal of finding common ground. The governor says he'll continue pushing efforts to ignite economic development in rural areas of the state, highlighting a recently formed advisory council. Representative Melinda White represents Washington and St. Tammany parishes. She says she looks forward to working with the governor's council to turn around declining small towns like Bogalusa, which is currently under state watch. I, of course, support our metro areas. We love our metro areas, but we really need the help in our rural areas, and I'm excited about anything that will move us forward with that. Now, the governor also says he will continue his fight to raise the minimum wage and work for equal pay. A person's DNA can hold the clues to a number of genetic conditions and rare disorders. A study of Cajuns here in Louisiana could lead to better therapies and possible cures for a number of genetic abnormalities. We went to the New Orleans Health Science Center to explore. In 1755, the descendants of French settlers living in eastern Canada were confronted with a dilemma, renounce their Catholic faith and pledge loyalty to the British monarchy or suffer the consequences. When the Acadian colonists refused, they were expelled from the region. Families were separated and dispersed to various countries. In 1765, a group of more than 200 Acadians arrived in South Louisiana. 23 years later, nearly 3,000 Acadians, or one-fourth of their original number, had found a new life in the Bayou State. Traveling within some of these settlers was a genetic mutation affecting the hearing of their offspring. Congenital hearing loss is actually, in the U.S., is about one per 1,000 individuals, and in the Louisiana Cajuns, it's estimated to be uh, three to six times more than that. Um, that's what we're trying to find out. Dr. Fern Shin is an associate professor of genetics at LSU's Health Science Center in New Orleans. She researches the changes in DNA that cause deafness from birth in Cajun children. The Cajuns are an example of what geneticists call a founder population, individuals separated from a larger group now sharing a smaller gene pool. If you isolate a group of people, like a few people that migrate to someplace else, or um, for some other reason, they're separated from the larger group, then you have this population with a select group of genes. If there's any mutation or changes in these genes, then you're going to see them in this population. Generations of geographical isolation and the tendency of Cajuns to marry Cajuns has caused deafness and other genetic conditions to appear more frequently within their community. For researchers, this makes it easier to study otherwise rare conditions and gene mutations found in the general population since they're shared among a smaller group. Shin works with the Health Center's Deaf Blind Project to analyze DNA samples from South Louisiana Cajuns with hearing loss. We have different methods of looking at the DNA. One of them is a called polymerase chain reaction, which is actually uh, making millions of copies of a piece of DNA for the genes causing hearing loss. And we actually look at it, we can visualize it on a gel. But also we look at DNA sequencing, in which we can actually sequence the whole genome, which is kind of read like all the sequences of all the DNA of the individual. Researchers scan the genes, which can number over 20,000 for a single person. Using a specialized software, they filter these down to just the genes involved in hearing loss. This process is called bioinformatics. It generates a visual representation of the relationship between genes known to cause hearing loss, genes discovered by Dr. Shin's team, and genes which could be related to both. We have discovered some new genes um, associated with hearing loss. 
Um, some of these genes have already been known to be involved in the development of the inner ear, uh, which is involved with hearing. What has not been discovered is that mutations or changes in, their, in the DNA of these genes have been associated with hearing loss. That has not been discovered in the past, and we're discovering some of these in these families. While Shin hopes to locate the genetic causes of congenital hearing loss in Cajuns, she also wants to emphasize the importance of genetic testing for these Acadian families. So it's very important for them to be um, aware of their um, chances of having other children with hearing loss, and also they have what chances are uh, of them to have children with, who have normal hearing. The other reason is because once we can provide the diagnosis for these parents, then they can actually have this official diagnosis they can actually use to obtain services for education, special resources, accommodations, anything that their child needs so they can become more successful. If you're a Cajun family who wants to participate in this deafblind study, please use the contact information you see on your screen. This segment is part of an outreach grant supporting the upcoming PBS limited series, Ken Burns Presents, The Gene, An Intimate History. And as a reminder, LPB is currently taking nominations for the 25th anniversary of Louisiana Young Heroes. Young Heroes honors high school students grades 9 through 12 who serve their communities, have overcome adversity, or have inspired others through their actions and strength of character. Nominations close on Monday, March 23rd. If you'd like to nominate a Louisiana Young Hero, go to lpb.org slash heroes. And everyone, that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our brand new app. Download it for free from your app store. This upgraded version features news, public affairs, documentaries, how-tos, and many more programs. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For all of us at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.